first, I want to welcome everyone. Uh, we are currently waiting for folks to uh, sign in. Uh, we are streaming live on Facebook. This is also being recorded to be posted online at uh, YouTube. And uh, we are just uh, waiting for some folks to come in. I want to thank everyone who is here with us tonight. I believe this might be our sixth or seventh year doing it. Uh, and so I see we've gotten, I guess, a critical mass. So I'll just uh, jump into things. So uh, good evening, Councilmember Ben Kalis, and welcome to our 2021 Overdevelopment, Preservation, and Affordable Housing Town Hall. I want to thank everyone for coming tonight and spending your Thursday evening with us. Uh, particularly, I want to thank our co-sponsor, Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney, and our borough president, Gail Brewer, and to amazing groups who we have here tonight, the New York City Department of Housing and Preservation, uh, Friends of the Upper East Side Historic District, Community Board 8, Civitas, and RX Home. Anywhere else in America, people struggle to get out. But here in New York City, we're struggling to stay. Spent my life as a renter in Manhattan, and like you, I know we need more affordable housing, and that super tall luxury towers have no place in residential neighborhoods, and they're not housing the New Yorkers struggling to afford the rent or living on the street. Tonight, we'll hear from a variety of perspectives. Not everybody on our panel will agree on exactly how New York should foster uh, lively residential neighborhoods, make our city more affordable, provide air and light, and find homes for the homeless New Yorkers. But well, we hope this dialogue will help get us closer to these goals. Zoning should provide predictability and reliability so we know what types of buildings can go up in which neighborhoods. When we start building super tall buildings that uh, rely on loopholes to get around the zoning laws uh, and they get extra skinny or feature 200, 150 feet of empty voids, uh, rather than building affordable housing for everyday New Yorkers, we have a problem. Every New Yorker should have a right to light and air, to see the sky, and should not be condemned to live in the shadows of the wealthy. Before the pandemic, we passed the proposal to limit the height of mechanical voids to 20 feet, a significant step forward towards stopping developers from getting around zoning to give billionaires view instead of building affordable housing for New Yorkers. Uh, this was only for the east side and the west side, uh, and it does not include the central business district. And so we still have that to do. Uh, we also uh, got a commitment to do a study on uh, how to do a deal with gerrymandered zoning lots, like the one we identified at 180 East 88th or 200 Amsterdam. There's something wrong when developers would rather build empty spaces to prop up wealthy rather than building affordable housing that 99% of New Yorkers need. Uh, buildings on stilts looked cool in the Jetsons, but the reality is that more like Brave Runner, uh, where the poor must live in the shadows below the wealthy above. These luxury towers won't build us out of the pandemic. Getting New Yorkers access to housing that already exists and building more affordable housing must be one of our top priorities. That brings us to our first panelist, Stephen Warner, who joins us through a pre recorded video. Stephen, an employee for HPD for years, blew the whistle when he noticed that landlords receiving city subsidies were not registering their units of affordable housing. He worked with us on stopping the practice and creating changes and passing a law. I'd like to welcome uh, Stephen Warner. Well, my name is Stephen Warner. Uh, I am currently a uh, administrative staff analyst with the New York City Department of Housing Preservation uh, and Development. I actually was hired 28 years ago by the agency to work on something called the New York City uh, Housing and Vacancy Report, which among other things, uh, required me to process uh, the uh, files from the New York State Department of Housing and Community Renewal that identified apartments in New York City that were rent stabilized. Uh, there are requirements for those uh, that are rent stabilized to report. And at the same time, uh, 
uh, the report that we publish by the uh, uh, agency includes uh, apartments that were not registered with the state, but were actually receiving tax benefits and should have been registering with the state. For my job, I also had to identify what were the J51 421A buildings that were getting tax exempt status that should have been registering. And in the book that we publish after the report is done, we were publishing the number, there are 1 million rent stabilized apartments in New York City. However, I was the one who was getting the files from the state to add up the number of registered buildings. And I never got past the number 800,000. So I said to my boss, you are perpetrating a fraud. We are telling people that there are a million stabilized units. We have the data on buildings that should be registered and aren't. Uh, if uh, we don't do something about this, I'm going uh, to go public with this. I was concerned, I was warned by many friends, I could get fired, I could lose my pension, or in some cases, people warned me I could go to jail. Anyway, I set up my website, I did what I said I would do, the story was covered by ProPublica, and I was called before the uh, city council to explain what I had done. And I uh, got to know the councilman Ben Kalos. He assisted me in getting legal counsel. My union stepped in, made sure I had legal counsel. And I uh, am very thankful for the support of Ben Kalos in particular. I want to thank Stephen Warner. He's here in his personal capacity today. And I think that Stephen is a hero. He's been working at HPD for more than 30 years. Uh, he's told me he's been trying to bring this to the attention of elected officials and others for 30 years. And we wouldn't have even known about the issue without his great work. Uh, I worked with him. I worked with uh, ProPublica, a reporter named Cesare Pudkul. And uh, that work led to um, a law called Local Law 64 of 2018, which requires landlords to register their affordable units with the city and for HPD to have an online, a centralized online housing portal to have a uniform, transparent process for marketing uh, existing afford new affordable housing. And the big change here is existing affordable housing. And uh, we actually have HPD with us today, so you can learn about it. Uh, one thing I'll tell you about is if you're interested in owning a piece of Manhattan and the Upper East Side, we have affordable home ownership opportunities right here on the Upper East Side on York Avenue in the 70s. And if you want, you're going to have to apply for it on the new portal we built together at housingconnect.nyc.gov. Um, as we move forward, we're going to be able to see thousands and hopefully all 200,000 units that Stephen was talking about back on the market. And uh, that that working with the mayor, that brings his original goal of 300,000 closer to half a million. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Aileen Reynolds, Executive Director of Housing Opportunity at HPD to speak about uh, Housing Connect 2.0. Thank you so much, council member. And yeah, what great timing that uh, 1402 York is live right when we're doing this presentation. So I'm so happy to introduce Housing Connect 2.0 to everyone and a little bit about uh, all the new features we have on, have developed in partnership with your office. Uh, so if uh, my slides could be shared, that'd be great. And while we wait for the slides to come up, I can just share that Housing Connect 2.0 uh, 
was launched uh, in July of last year. So we're coming up on one year of our revamped uh, housing portal, and it's been a really successful start. And we're you know, looking forward to continuing to use Housing Connect and all of its new features. While we are- uh, Apologies, I'm getting an error message. So just gonna keep trying. Or I could share, Jesse, if you want to give me permission. Uh, you should now have the ability to share. Okay. Can you see? Yes, we can. Great. Okay, so the new Housing Connects, like I said, launched in July of last year. And just comparing it to the original Housing Connect with, which if you are familiar, uh, launched in 2013. And the original Housing Connect really just took what was a once a paper application process for the housing lotteries and put it online. That's really all it did. And so in 2020, the overhaul brought so many new features. Uh, which, of course, includes offering rental opportunities uh, to the public. In addition, it now offers homeownership opportunities and, as the council member referenced, re-rental and resale opportunities are available through the Housing Connect portal. It's also a uh, mobile-friendly site. You can upload your eligibility documents right through the portal, and you can also update your application in real time. So these are just some of the high level updates that we made to the system. And overall, Housing Connect 2.0 is more accurate, efficient, and accessible than the previous site. So it's more accurate in that it guides housing seekers to apply for and look at housing that meets their needs and their choices. It also helps them understand the income restrictions that come with affordable housing and where your household will land uh, among the many different AMI and rent categories that are offered. It's more efficient in that applicants can upload their eligibility documents right through the portal and communicate with the developers and their marketing agents through the site. So no longer is there a need to appear in person or go to an interview uh, or to communicate over lengthy emails, it's now all encompassed into this one portal. And it's more accessible. This is so important to us. It's a uh, top scoring ADA features. It can be translated into over 200 languages. And as I mentioned earlier, it is a user centered uh, and mobile friendly design. So whether you're on a phone, a tablet or your computer, the site will work for you. So if for those who aren't familiar, uh, the lottery system works in that applicants apply either on Housing Connect or we will always have a paper process for those who choose to do so. And all of those applications are entered into the Housing Connect portal once a deadline passes. Those applications are randomized and everyone is assigned a lottery number generated on a lottery log. And then that is the order in which uh, the opportunity is made available to the public. So that is what we mean when we say lottery, uh, everyone's randomized and then processed in that randomized order. And because uh, you might have a different lottery log number for each opportunity you apply for, we have uh, added a feature called a dashboard into the new Housing Connect that really increases the transparency of what's going on with your application. So you can see the status of your various applications. If it's pending, you know, you haven't been selected yet for that lottery. If you're in process, that means your lottery log number did come up. And most relevantly, action required is when it's time for you to take action on your application, such as submit eligibility documents uh, or even best news, respond to a unit offer. So that's action required. 
and then completed is at the end of each lottery, you'll see uh, the application in the completed category. And with all of these updates, you can also get email and soon text notifications. So you're always in tune with your application on Housing Connect. And just want to highlight that HPD has a variety of resources available to the public to help everyone access affordable housing opportunities. So on the Housing Connect site itself, we have uh, trainings and learned videos as well as FAQs. And then in addition on HPD's website, we have checklists and resources and guides that can help you navigate the entire process and get familiar with how to how the process works when you are selected in an affordable housing lottery. And one last plug is that we do have housing ambassadors who are local nonprofit uh, NGO community-based organizations that work with us to help connect applicants to Housing Connect and navigate the process. So you can see uh, organizations in and around your area that are housing ambassadors if you'd like some one-on-one -on -one help with your Housing Connect application. So yeah, that's, uh, that's the highlight for Housing Connect 2.0. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you very much. Uh, in the council, we get to legislate, but it takes folks like Aileen and HPD to operationalize and create things and make these things into reality. We have a number of questions that came in for HPD about Housing Connect. Uh, those are, we're going to hold those till the end uh, and make sure we get to as many of the questions as we can. Uh, so thank you. I, I'm incredibly happy about Housing Connect 2.0. I'm really hoping that it can make a huge dent in the affordable housing crisis. I think one of the things I hear about is people who are underhoused, like we, we spent most of this pandemic in a one bedroom with my wife and daughter. And I hear about people who are overhoused where they, they may have had a family and they may have had a two or three bedroom and now they need a one bedroom or a studio, but a rent regulated two or three bedroom is going to be less expensive than a market rate one bedroom. And so folks are ending up trapped in housing. And so I'm hoping that through Housing Connect, we can create a situation where when folks are ready to move out into uh, newer, perhaps even nicer uh, how affordable housing that they're able to sign up, be pulled into the minimum lotteries, get either new affordable housing or re-rentals. And then as soon as they move, we get another unit back. And about 15% of New York City moves, I believe about five to 10% of people in rent regulated housing move every year. And so whether it's a million units or what have you, uh, we're going to be looking at between tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of units uh, coming back online. And I think that will really help people uh, find the affordable housing that they need. It is the top concern we hear from people. Um, I'd like to now welcome uh, the Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts. Uh, we've been working with them uh, for years and uh, I, I did not know I was a preservationist until I got elected. And uh, Friends has helped me learn a lot along the way. Um, I still don't know the difference between different architectural elements on certain buildings, but uh, they again have been incredibly helpful. But where they've really stepped up is on taking on what's going on with our zoning. And one of the larger problems we're seeing in our city and have seen for a very long time, dating back to when we first created the zoning law is what I call profit driven planning. And that's where a developer comes to the city to print cash and what have you, uh, to print cash and uh, do what is basically an illegal spot zoning so that they can make money that they wouldn't otherwise be entitled to because they rarely have paid the fair market rate for what it would have been had it been rezoned. Uh, and so there's a lot of that going around. And then we talked a little bit about the voids. Uh, when I got elected, I wanted to work with the community to figure out how we could get some predictability back in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And Friends of the Historic District uh, raised money on their own, got modest funding from our office, and really led the way for our district, for the borough of Manhattan, and actually the city. Um, things like saving our landmarks law, which the city council tried to gut on its 
50th anniversary or 20, 50th anniversary. On the 50th anniversary, they started trying to gut the landmarks law. There are people out there who would like to get rid of landmarks in Manhattan and the larger five boroughs. Uh, Friends was at the front of that fight. Uh, they helped us lead the fight on the zoning loopholes, identified the voids issue. Uh, and uh, I believe tonight they are here to share a, a new thread uh, relating to just residential districts. And I guess just one thing that's completely, I guess, topsy-turvy is the notion that we have a, a governor and other elected officials talking about converting our commercial district into a residential district at the same time as we have other developers talking about turning our residential districts into commercial districts. And that just really feels like turning zoning on its head for the single purpose of raising, of making money. So I'd like to now welcome and turn it over to uh, Rachel Levy at Friends of the Upper East Side Historic District. Thank you so much, uh, Council Member Kalos. Um, Jesse, would you like me to share my slides directly or do it's I up, do it? Up to you, I think you wanted to do it, so you do have permission. Okay, okay, excellent, thank you. Let me get these up, hold on a second. All right, can you, you can all see my slides, I hope. Um, yep. Okay, good, let me just adjust here. Um, so good evening, everybody. I'm Rachel Levy. Um, I'm the executive director of Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts. Um, I just want to thank Councilmember Kalos, Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney, uh, our borough president, Gail Brewer, for sponsoring this discussion, not this only this year, but every year. Um, it's a great chance to connect with people, share our work, and learn more about what all of our colleagues are doing citywide. So thank you. Uh, Friends of the Upper East Side was founded in 1982. We're a nonprofit organization dedicated to preserving and celebrating the architectural legacy, livability, and sense of place of the Upper East Side. In addition to our work monitoring the area's historic districts and landmarks and advocating for the landmarks law, as the council member mentioned, um, as well as our ongoing efforts to expand preservation protections in Yorkville, Friends has been a leader in land use and zoning discussions impacting this neighborhood really since our very beginning. Um, one of our earliest wins in the 1980s was the mapping of R8B contextual zoning um, that protected and still protects the height and scale of our mid blocks. Uh, and I'll say more a little bit about that soon. Um, but more recently, uh, a focus of our work has been to track on our online development map and then also to challenge when needed out of scale development um, projects that we believe are fundamentally at odds with zoning principles that have been established and you know for many, many years in our neighborhood. Um, and all of this gets back to the belief that we sh we share strongly, which is that with good urban planning and common sense zoning, our neighborhood can be a place where there are both historic resources in harmony with new development. And you know, I think that's very important to keep, uh, keep in mind. So through this tracking of, of development that was happening in the neighborhood, one of the things we noticed um, was the exploitation of mechanical void space. Um, this didn't count at all towards zoning and it was being used basically to boost the height of residential buildings in our neighborhood way beyond what zoning had predicted and um, way beyond really what anybody had predicted. And so, you know, these are a few examples of some of the buildings. Uh, 249 East 62nd Street was kind of the, the Jetsons building poster child uh, proposal that had 150 feet of empty void space in the middle. That's the equivalent of a 15 story building, just basically for free, um, not counting at all towards zoning. And, you know, this was something that became really profitable and couldn't have been imagined by the people who were drafting our zoning resolution 50 years ago. Um, so this, we, you know, we were starting to see buildings where 20 and 30% of their volume were basically these exempt mechanical spaces, uh, undermining the predictability of zoning, creating public safety issues regarding, you know, fire safety and that sort of thing. Um, so we worked with the council member very closely and um, the Department of City Planning to, to get the city to, to wake up and take notice. Um, and we achieved the first, uh, uh, mechanical void text amendment in 2019 that for the first time put some limits on mechanical void spaces um, in high density residential districts. So there's a lot more work to be done. Um, we need to bring this to central business districts. There are plenty of other zoning loopholes out there that developers are, 
are innovating every day to, to boost buildings beyond you know, the height and uh, bulk of what zoning is there to really predict and, and protect um, in neighborhoods. Uh, but it was, it was a fantastic start um, and we were proud to work with the council member in doing that. Oops. Um, but I, I do wanna get to uh, the New York Blood Center which is uh, the big issue that we're dealing with right now and working very closely with um, neighbors and the community board and other community members who are, who are working uh, against, to, to oppose this project. And I'll introduce it, I guess, by saying that, so this is the New York Blood Center uh, building. It's on 67th Street between 1st and 2nd Avenues. It's a low rise building um, on the mid block. So it fits into that R8B uh, contextual zoning that I mentioned. And the zoning was established in the 1980s to basically reinforce the existing typology of our neighborhood, which is that, it, you know, it's pretty um, intuitive that you have large buildings on the avenues and lower, lower rise buildings on the mid blocks. What this project would do is totally subvert that typology. Um, and it would be the first rezoning of one of these contextual districts on the Upper East Side um, in over 35 years, really the first one since this was mapped. Um, and so you can see here, this is the um, elevation of 67th Street as it is now with the existing blood center, and then what it would look like with this um, 334 foot commercial building. Um, it's important to note, I think that, you know, the blood center is an institution that's been in our neighborhood since the 1960s. Uh, they do good work and, you know, they need, perhaps they need a new building. They could do this within the existing zoning, but what they're seeking to do is um, they're applying for a, an array of zoning changes and special permits to permit them to, to develop this as a commercial site in partnership with a private for-profit developer. Um, so most of this building, in fact, the, the entire portion in red, two thirds of the building would be commercial laboratory space with the blood center only occupying the lower third of the building. Um, this project is across the street from a big complex of six schools in the Julia Richmond complex, St. Catherine's Park, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, which is really one of the only parks in the neighborhood and would cast uh, quite a shadow, which I'll show you. This is what they could do um, today without applying for any zoning changes. It would be a building that would actually grant the blood center itself more space than they are looking for in the proposal. Um, and here, I think you can see how um, the Julia Richmond building and St. Catherine's Park are, um, are, are really right up against uh, this site. So this is a look at the shadow impact. Um, by total coincidence, the day that we modeled happens to be today, May 6th. And so you can see that during much of the afternoon, um, which are you know, the hours that school-aged children are really using the park, the park would be casting new shadow from this building. This has to do with not only the height, but also the, um, the floor plate of the building. As you can see, the site goes, the lot goes all the way through the block from 67th to 66th streets. This means that the floor plates of the building will be closer in size to buildings like the Empire State Building, One Vanderbilt, the buildings in Hudson Yard, you know, really midtown level commercial buildings. And unlike anything that we've ever seen on the Upper East Side, let alone on a mid block. Um, so, you know, the impact on the park, on the street life, you know, the, the sidewalk, the south southern exposure of the Julia Richmond campus, which has six schools, um, would really be impacted by this project. And so what are we doing about it and how can you get involved? Um, Friends is working closely with a coalition of neighbors uh, who are organizing around this. We have a dedicated web page on our website, which you can find at the address above. Um, we're raising money for this. We've retained uh, an urban planner, George James, with whom we work closely on many topics, uh, land use attorneys. Um, and you know, we're, this is not, just about the blood center. In fact, the, the proposal is really more about the commercial developer um, than the blood center at all. Um, and we are viewing this really as the potential to set a precedent for all of our mid blocks on the Upper East Side and citywide. Um, so that's why I'm showing here the R8B zoning districts of the Upper East Side. Um, if it can happen on 67th Street, it could happen on you know, 97th Street on 87th Street. And this is something that we should all be concerned about. Um, and, you know, we're 
trying to raise awareness around this. Um, so check out uh, lots more information on our website. You can sign up for updates, donate to support the cause, all of that. Um, and just a few other ways to get involved. Um, the community board, so this is going through the public review process. They're seeking a rezoning. So it's going through ULERP, which has just started. The community board hearing is next week, May 12th. Um, we need lots of people to show up and, and voice their opinions on this. Um, there will be a continuation at the community board later on in May. Um, and we're or working together with the neighbors, um, uh, the council member and other elected officials as well on a press conference that will be um, in, later in May as well. So those are some different ways to get involved and lots more information to check out. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And uh, thank you for, uh, to friends for, for really stepping up on this issue. Um, it's incredibly important that everyone come out and make their voices heard. I know that it can become frustrating sometimes because uh, as a resident, we're busy. We're very busy with life. And the question is, uh, I think this might be the, the fourth or fifth time the community board is dealing with this. Partly it's because as an elected official working with Gail Brewer and Senator Liz Kruger, uh, both of whom have come out in opposition to this project, we wanted to make sure that this project got more public notice uh, so that there was more opportunity for people to have their voices heard. Typically, folks would be finding out about the project for the first time now. Uh, please do go to, if this is something that you are concerned about and you support the position that you are hearing from friends of the Upper East Side Historic District, uh, please consider uh, donating to their organization, donating to this issue. Um, we are still hoping to learn more information from residents as it plays out through the community board process. Uh, and so if you want to weigh in directly with my office, you can do so at benkalos.com slash petition slash blood center, one word. And so far we are up to 665 signatures and the vast majority of what we received is in opposition to this project. Uh, so I wanna thank everyone for uh, their activism on this. Uh, democracy means folks have to show up and keep showing up. So there will be the two meetings in May and that will uh, continue uh, through this process. After that, it will be going to the borough president and then it will come to the council uh, probably by the end of this summer, probably early September. Uh, if, if the applicants choose to continue moving forward. Uh, we're, the, the, the next one I'd like to share is um, when I first got elected, uh, I, I got, I, I, I'm an, a union side labor and employment lawyer, not a land use attorney. I've since represented the community and land use issues, uh, particularly in the East River 50s Alliance litigation against the city. Uh, and uh, I've learned a lot about land use over the years. And when I first got elected, the only contextual zoning that existed uh, for uh, the highest densest districts in the city, which is an R10, uh, was an R10A, which was a 210 foot height cap. Um, and what we were able to negotiate with uh, Mayor de Blasio working with Gail Brewer is that in Manhattan, south of 96th Street, if you were an R10A district uh, and you wanted to build affordable, if you wanted to go over 210 feet, you would need to include affordable housing. And so the idea being that a lot of the affordable housing we see, particularly on the Upper East Side, isn't on the Upper East Side. You can build affordable housing in East Harlem uh, and then, uh, pull the air rights you, you get as a bonus to the Upper East Side. And that's not fair because people on the Upper East Side want affordable housing. And we would like to see the site, the, the affordable housing built on site. And so some one way we could do that is through actually forcing mandatory inclusionary housing. And uh, I will turn it over to Anthony Cohn, uh, the Community Board 8 co-chair for zoning and development. Um, I want to thank uh, him for being here tonight. I also want to thank uh, Elizabeth Ashby, his co-chair, 
as well as uh, the Chair Emeritus, uh, Lane Walsh, who's done an incredible amount of work on this over these years. And uh, the hope here is that we could actually force any new development over a certain height to include affordable housing. And so I'll turn it over to Anthony who can share all the details. Anthony, we need you to unmute. Sorry. Um, okay. Um, thank you, Council Member Kalos. Uh, I'm speaking about one of CB8's main zoning and development goals, long range goals, the creation of two new special districts for our Eastern avenues. I was trained as, as an historian, and I've always brought that training to my work as an architect. It is, I think, important to look back as we look forward. That's why I'm showing you the photo on the lower left, which was taken a block from my apartment uh, about a century ago. The photo on the right, taken this morning from the same spot, more or less, reminds us of what we've lost and what remains for us to build upon. In 1950, the City Planning Commission uh, commissioned a report called a plan for the rezoning of New York uh, that became the basis 10 years later of the current zoning. It began, the proper function of zoning, although often misunderstood, is simple and clear cut. Zoning regulations constitute an exercise of the police power to control two things. First, the use of land and buildings, and second, the size and shape of buildings and their location in relation to each other. For convenience, these two types of controls are referred to as use regulations and bulk regulations. In short, it's the responsibility of government to shape and control our public environment to protect us all from our individual excesses. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, too far, way too far. Keep going back, keep going back. There, oop, there perfect. Okay, uh, yeah, great. Um, we proposed two special zoning districts for the eastern portion of, of Community Board 8. Lenox Hill, which is between 60th and 79th Street, that's sort of shaded in blue, and Yorkville between 79th and 96th Street, shaded in red. On the Eastern avenues, no height limit exists. Encouraging the assembly of large development parcels, wholesale transfers of development rights, and an accompanying loss of affordable housing, local retail and small business activities, and the permanent loss of neighborhood character. That's what we have now. The cornerstones of these new special districts will be an absolute height limit of 210 feet on the avenues which will be based on a height and setback development model with street walls of 60 to 85 feet high and which will allow buildings with the floor area ratio as of right of 10 or uh, if they include, including um, affordable housing, 12. And that'll all fit within that zoning envelope. Along with the height limit, we propose a restriction on demolition of old and new law tenements, which currently serve as the primary affordable housing stock in CB8. This provision, when it's finally all worked out, will be modeled on similar restrictions in other parts of the city, like Clinton and Little Italy. And finally, the proposal will incorporate changes found in the city council's plan for retail diversity that will strengthen the local service business and prioritize affordable retail space, which is one of the huge problems, new developments, big spaces, um, and no place for the um, displaced small local businesses like the um, shoe repair place or the laundry. The small map on the lower right of this slide shows that there are a limited number of buildings taller than 210 feet in the district right now which makes action on this proposal even more urgent. Next slide, please. Here we go, perfect. Um, okay, 
why 210? Why not 250 or 350 or 400? There are two really good reasons for this. I've annotated this map of the zoning districts in, in community board eight to highlight the existing height limits, either by special district or zoning designation, um, as Ben uh, alluded to, the allowable heights of the Western avenues and the major east-west streets is 210 feet. With the exception of Lexington, which as a narrow avenue, it's only 70 feet wide, um, it has a height limit of 170 feet. 210, therefore, is really normal for this part of the city. There's also a historical reason for this. The 1916 zoning, which was the first zoning resolution in the world, based street and wall height, based street wall height rather, on street width. The residential avenues of the Upper East Side had a street wall width mandated of one and a half times the street width or about 150 feet. Next slide, please. Uh, and the upper left is uh, a view of 79th Street looking west from 2nd Avenue about 1930. Most of the buildings have a kind of more or less common cornice line at around what we now call the, um, uh, the R8B zoning. And you can see the 3rd Avenue L running across the center of the screen. The, the lower slide below that is 86th Street looking west so that in the before the 1960 zoning, uh, most of the Upper East Side, east of Lexington Avenue, looked like this. The slide on the image on the right shows the Third Avenue from about 75th Street uh, as it is today. The tall building in the foreground is just under 200 feet tall and the tower on 77th, so well, it's actually 78th Street, um, is in excess of 300 feet tall. Next, please. One more then and now. 79th Street looking west from 2nd Avenue. Sorry, excuse me. One more then and now, 79th and 1st in about 1930 and this, and the same view, more or less, this morning. The original zoning resolution based its bulk regulations on height. The new zoning, 60 years old this year, bases bulk on floor area ratio with no built-in height limits. The height limits have come about um, over the intervening 60 years, which is one of the reasons why the zoning text of 1961 was 293 pages long. And as of January, the zoning resolution was 2,700 pages long. Every time a too tall development goes up, and this is the point of zoning of a 210 height limit, we are all robbed of a little bit more of our light and our air and our sky. We also lose a little bit of our neighborhood character the personality of place that makes a city a home. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. That was, that was beautiful. Thank you. I, I, where did you find those photos? Um, actually, those are from the New York, uh, New York Public Library photo collection, which is really well organized and easy to use, and they're all free and downloadable. Amazing. Uh, you can also get some great photos from uh, Doris. Uh, she's, she's my favorite city agency. I, I ascribe a gender to her. It's called the Department of Records and Information Services. And uh, yes. they've got a library down in the surrogates court. And uh, they've got a huge uh, list of different addresses from when they used to take photos of every single property. Uh, they, yes, they, that, that was, that was uh, Department of Finance. Those are online now. Uh, for okay. a long time, you actually had to go down there and leaf through bad Xeroxes or go through microfilm to find the images. So uh, it's it, it it came just in time for the pandemic. Thank you, thank you for your great presentation. I, I 
I learned a lot. That, that is saying a lot. So thank you. And we're lucky to have you as a co-chair of the Zoning Committee on Community Board 8. Uh, I'd like to now talk about uh, Civitas. When I first got elected and we were looking to see what we could do uh, to encourage more affordable housing, uh, we provided uh, modest funding from our office to friends, uh, to the Community Board 8, and also to Civitas. Uh, all three organizations have a tremendous record of uh, fighting for preservation and getting huge wins. Uh, today, we're going to hear from William Q. Brothers, co-chair of their Land Use Committee, and uh, they'll be speaking about, I believe, their C1-9X proposal. Can you hear me now? There we go. S slide one, if you will. There, uh, my name is Bill Brothers and I'm co-chair of, of Civitas Zoning and Land Use Committee along with Sharon Pope. There, uh, we are actually coming somewhat to many of the same conclusions that you've just heard. Uh, there, uh, as a result of the opening of the S Second Avenue subway in 2017, and the uh, fast escalating re real estate values in the area, it became apparent that the super tall buildings on 57th Street were gonna start to invade the, uh, the, the Upper East Side and, get, and come into our neighborhoods. Uh, the, in this, you will see that basically a couple of recent examples uh, of very similar of the zoning loopholes that Rachel was talking about. Uh, the C19 zoning districts have no height restriction. And those C19 districts are all part of the area east of Second Avenue subway uh, and, and around it. Third Avenue between East 60th and East 93rd, Second Avenue from 66th to 85th Street, First Avenue from 62nd, 63rd, and York. Um, second slide. Civitas began to study what zoning options were to help that. And they had a, uh, and what the possibilities were. We hired, uh, we spoke to community stakeholders. We talked to some local officials. Uh, we, um, um, and we looked at mapping exactly where the issues were. Okay. Uh, slide three. We hired uh, BFJ planners who we'd worked on a number of projects with since 1986. Those projects, including the contextual zoning of the cross streets, 96, 86, and 72nd Street, and the uh, RAB protection of mid blocks that Rachel mentioned. Okay, the goals of the study that we, were, that we wanted to do and that we were proposing were one is to place a clear control on building heights to maintain existing neighborhood character. We felt that that, there was, that was the only way to actually control the bulk. Encourage preservation of existing and the development of new affordable housing, which we all know is extremely difficult due to land prices in the area, uh, and to create a reasonable and feasible height limit without imposing a down zoning in the area. And that was a big issue because we, we really believe a lot of what Anthony just said and, and where Rachel's gone and, and actually we support the blood center. Uh, but we wanted to find what we thought was a height limit that would be acceptable to city planning. Next slide. This is probably pretty hard to see, but basically what it's saying, and it's very similar to what Anthony just said, is that there are, if you look, that's a profile of Third Avenue on either side, going from 72nd to 96th, and then a list of this building heights. There are 960 buildings in the C19 district that are to under 210 feet tall, 48 buildings from 210 to 300, 38 buildings from 300 to 350, 12 buildings from 350 to 400, and 13 buildings over 400 feet tall. In summary, that's 960 buildings 
that are less than 210 feet and 109 buildings that are over 210 feet. Uh, we took this data with BFJ and we studied the, the context of these buildings and crafted a revised owning tax C19X, which would be, it would affect not just the heights, but also the setbacks. Uh, again, similar to what Anthony said about getting uh, a, an initial setback that would be more um, kind to its neighbors along the, um, the, the avenues. And the, uh, and we looked at both the towers and quality housing buildings. Um, with uh, we felt that we were going to have to go, the next step was probably going to be this craft 197C application, which we began and we uh, went through it with a number of community groups. We went forward with it. Uh, we showed it to the borough president in uh, May of 2019. We showed it to Councilman Kalos. Uh, and, and ask for a supported city planning. Uh, we discussed the various height limits at that time between 210 and as high as 400, of which has been, that had been one of our original proposals because we felt that, that uh, the values were gonna start driving buildings well above 400 as well. Uh, Councilman Kalis was in support of the 210 foot limit and, and that, but said that he felt very comfortable that he could support our uh, interest in affordable housing. Um, slide five. Uh, based on this, we produced a plan which we felt used height bonuses to incentivize the use of zoning, of inclusionary zoning statutes, which would produce new affordable housing. And that we felt it was necessary to be taller than 210 in order to be able to use the, um, to use zoning lot mergers, which would uh, preserve adjacent properties, which include, which would include, and that would include affordable housing and community character. Um, the zoning proposal that was done and, and has and, and stabilized the zoning at the numbers it has without any sound zoning. There's a tower on the base with an FAR of 10 at 300 feet. And if you do include inclusionary zoning, you get a maximum of 350 feet, which we felt would help, uh, again, incentivize a uh, developer to look towards affordable housing. Quality housing with an FAR of 10 would be 215 feet. With it and an FAR of 12, it would have a maximum height of 250 feet. Um, that's basically where our proposal is and how we got there. And thank you for uh, listening to us. Uh, thank you to uh, William and Civitas. Uh, I, I just have to say we provided very modest seed funding to get the conversation started expressing interest. I know that Civitas raised an enormous amount of money to go beyond the initial study to go to the city planning commission with Department of City Planning with uh, what I believe was a, a complete and ready application. And I think what is most frustrating to me, whether it was the 210 that the community board passed a resolution on and DCP, at least according to the charter, was supposed to act on it, which they haven't in seven years, or the fact that Civitas came with uh, a private application and this, the city also refused to do an affordable housing plan. And for, for my sake, what I would just say is what is currently happening isn't working. And DCP put out a recent study that found that between the demolitions of all the rent regulated housing and other things happening in the free market, the Upper East Side is making very modest gains. And that's frustrating because if you talk to any up, Upper East Sider and anyone in Manhattan, hell, anyone in New York City, they will tell you it has been nonstop building. And the idea that we're building, 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 and we're not getting new housing units, and we're losing rent regulated affordable housing at an alarming pace. That's just very frustrating. And so whether it's the Civitas proposal, which would give us affordability and, and predictability, or the community board eight proposal, I, I'm just desperate for anything we can get under this mayor before he is done. And ultimately, a lot of this may end up being something that 
if you are interested, you should be asking the candidates for mayor. Uh, something that I think has gone unsaid and is important to say is that the city planning commission uh, is made up of, I believe, 13 people and uh, the borough presidents each get an appointment and uh, the public advocate gets an appointment and that's six. And then the mayor, I believe, gets seven. And so doing the math, uh, you might think, well, maybe, maybe somebody might break and vote differently than the mayor asks. And if they did that, that might be their last vote on the city planning commission. And so um, it is basically controlled by the mayor and uh, whoever the next mayor is will be the one who determines either if we can't get this mayor to do it and um, then it'll be the next mayor who determines it and it'll be the next city council and it'll be a, the next borough president. There is a uh, citywide primary on June 22nd uh, and then there will also be an election in November. So I think that's there. I'm, I'm, a lot of folks are asking questions about how they can get involved, how they can have an impact. Uh, if there is a uh, group, if there's a proposal that they feel is inspiring them, uh, please, they've all shared their contact information. You can also get their contact information from us. If you see a proposal that you like, please reach out to them and let them know. Uh, give your volunteer time, give your dollars. Uh, these are all speaking nonprofits and uh, do what you can to help. Uh, I'd like to now welcome uh, Caitlin LaCroix from Homeless Solutions Policy Director for RX Home, who will be speaking about affordability and how we all have a role in ending homelessness in our city. Thanks, Council Member Callis. And so once my slides are up, I'll start going. Um, so hi, once again, I'm Caitlin LaCroix and I am the policy director at Prescription Home. We are an organization that's working to build the political will and the public demand to end homelessness in New York City. Uh, homelessness is really a policy problem at the end of the day. It's um, a systems problem as well and it's all solved by housing. So what our goal is, is to give New Yorkers information about this problem and how we can collectively demand for our elected leaders to actually invest in the solutions that we know work and work in other municipalities as far away as Helsinki and as close to home as Bergen County, New Jersey to actually make measurable reductions in the homelessness population. So um, just to start off on the next slide. Um, it's first good to contextualize the number of people experiencing homelessness in New York City. So we have about 77,934 um, people experiencing homelessness according to the last point in time count. That translates into two city fields. It's hard for me to think about those big numbers without putting it into a context. But when we're actually talking about homelessness, we're talking about families and children. 95% of the people experiencing homelessness in New York City are residing in a city shelter. And of that 95%, 60% are families with children. So when we're talking about homelessness in New York City, we're talking about mostly women and children. And when we're talking about these kids, they're predominantly under the age of five. So when people make arguments in New York City that it's um, homelessness is an experience that's due to personal failings or flaws, we can actually see the systemic issues that are yielding homelessness when we talk about kids as being the main people who experience it. Um, and when we're talking about homelessness in New York City, we also think it's important from the prescription home perspective to also ground this. It's a citywide problem. There is no place or neighborhood in New York City that isn't touched by homelessness. So that's why we all need to be aware of this issue and we all need to be able to use our voices to actually advocate for real solutions. Um, on the next slide, what we like to highlight at Prescription Home is the real housing drivers that are pushing people in New York City to experience homelessness. So our minimum wage is $15. To afford a one bedroom apartment at fair market rate, you have to work 100 hours to actually be able to not be overly rent burdened, which is 30%. So if we're thinking realistically, this person's not gonna have a life 
It is so hard to work 100 hours and be able to thrive or take care of kids. Um, what you actually need to have a one bedroom is to make an hourly wage of about $37. And when we're talking about what our one bedroom apartment is in New York City, the fair market rate for a one bedroom is about $1,800. So it just contextualizes what's affordable in New York City to low income people isn't actually affordable to them. Uh, the what would be an affordable rent to a person who's making minimum wage is actually around $750. So on the next slide, um, the thing is we also know that this problem is something that New Yorkers care about. So why aren't we making traction on it? Um, we did a recent poll in December and we found that 98% of New Yorkers who we polled think that homelessness is a serious issue and should be a priority for the next mayoral um, administration. Uh, we also found that 90% of New Yorkers, which is pretty overwhelming, think that we've been doing the wrong policies. So the real question is, why haven't we done anything different? And that's because um, the constituency of who advocates for homelessness to date has been the people experiencing homelessness. We haven't widened the tent. And that's why we think it's important for all New Yorkers to see that they play in a role in ensuring that we do policy change here. Um, on our next slide, another thing I'd really like to highlight is that more New Yorkers than you think are on the brink of homelessness or have a friend or family member or a colleague who's experienced homelessness. Um, in our poll, we asked New Yorkers if they have ever experienced homelessness and it was surprising that 50% of respondents said yes. Um, we also found that it was just as surprising when we're talking about in the last 12 months during the pandemic. So even with the eviction moratorium, we saw that there is a large percentage of New Yorkers who are experiencing homelessness and who have a real stake in having policy change. Now, you are going to hear from naysayers that we don't have enough money in the city budget to end homelessness and that we actually don't know what policies work. But with a $3 billion budget where 69% of that budget goes to shelters, we can make change. That money is able to be used to pay for rental assistance and ensure that we are giving New Yorkers the tools they need to actually be able to live in a home of their own. So if we go to our last slide, um, what can you all do to learn and be a part of the movement to end homelessness? So the first thing is, learn about who's experiencing homelessness and why. The misconceptions are out there and it really stops us from acting. So we think that informed New Yorkers are the ones that can make change. Then learn more about the proven solutions to ending homelessness. Every Thursday night, Prescription Home is holding a workshop and we talk about other cities where they've made real strides to ending homelessness and preventing it. We talk about how New York City can do similar things. And we go into the nitty gritty policy proposals, which I love, I'm a policy person, um, and you guys can as well, uh, that really can make change. It's something that we can all advocate for. It's not difficult and it's focusing on housing first. And then last but not least, we think using your voice for change is what allows us to actually have this real switch moment and make the momentum to switch how the city currently manages homelessness through a large shelter system into a housing first city where we actually look to prevent homelessness before it happens and provide rental assistance to those in the community or leaving institutional settings, along with providing people currently in our shelter system, the housing resources and stock that they need to be able to move from shelter into permanent housing. So with all that said, we'd love for all of you to come and learn more. And we have a weekly Thursday night workshop and uh, we love people coming to them. So please feel free. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess <clears throat> incredibly informative. Is supportive housing a helpful tool for getting folks off the street and out of shelters? Uh, supportive housing, yes, has been shown by research to be the most effective tool for that 5% of people who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness on the streets. Um, is it the silver bullet to the whole solution? No. So, but, but it, we, it, does, we, it does help a very succinct portion. So uh, opening a, a supportive housing for, for homeless women and children was a good thing to do on nine, in, in the neighborhood across oh, totally. the And then similarly, where do, 
where does the new safe haven model fit in to the, the shelter model uh, versus the, the current model of congregate housing? Uh, that's a great question. So safe havens are shelter by another name. While they are lower barrier, they are not what New Yorkers who are experiencing homelessness are asking for. They're asking for housing. So safe havens are something that they don't want. And we know that while some New Yorkers will take it as a quick stopgap, it's actually not the real pathway where we see the connections to housing happening. I, I disagree when we've been on the street and talking to homeless people, they've shared that they are uncomfortable with the congregate setting and that if they did have a room of their own, similar to a, a single room occupancy uh, with their own bathroom, uh, that they would actually welcome it. A lot of the supportive housing that we have follows a very similar model where folks do have a more SR, a single room occupancy model. And it's a, a tool that on the West side has really worked to get folks off the street. And this neighborhood, we probably have about a dozen or two dozen folks who have been chronically homeless and, and on the streets. And when we've spoken to them, they're, they're very interested. But I do agree with you about housing first. And we actually did an op-ed with Fred Shack from Urban Pathways. The city spent $6,000 a month on housing, uh, uh, housing homeless families. And for $6,000, you can actually get a, a two bedroom on the Upper East Side at market rate. And there were a lot of people who wrote obituaries about New York City saying that the way we know New York City is dead is because of all the vacant apartments. And um, there's, uh, as you correctly said, there are more homeless children in shelters than homeless men single men, and there's about 17,000 family members, 13,000 children together. I think they come out to like 35,000, forgive me for fudging the numbers a little bit, but it's actually just 10,000 families. So we could rent 10,000 apartments or even buy them. It'd actually be even cheaper to just buy co-ops and condos. Um, I lived in a market rate building with a group home in the building, and I, they were great neighbors. They were great kids. They are now adults many of them, uh, but I think it's it's a great model to both end homelessness and uh, integrate. How, how do you like the idea of renting vacant apartments for homeless families and then saving like a thousand, two thousand, three thousand that we can use to provide wraparound services? Oh, I think it's fantastic. It's working really well in Denver as well, where they're doing this right now. They're, the city is master leasing apartments um, and covering the gap between what the rental assistance rate is and what the rate of market rent. So you're able to like still use city assets, like city perhaps, but you're also actually able to use the available housing stock. Okay. So we had told some of our participants that we would get, we, we would try to wrap up at about 7.30. So we have a number of prepared questions um, and uh, we have a handful that came in. Uh, so uh, let me just drop into, just check in. Uh, HPD, are you able to stay or are we going to lose you at exactly 7.30? I'm good. Okay. Uh, that is incredibly generous of you. I would have let you jump the line. Uh, okay. So um, we'll start. We received two questions that were pre-submitted. Uh, the first one is, what is the definition of overdevelopment? And I'll call on friends or Civitas if they want to answer that question. Sure. Um, I can say a little. Um, I mean, I, you know, there's no one, one definition, I guess, but in the way that we think of it uh, is development that exceeds uh, what zoning has laid out for us as the, uh, as the guideposts, I guess, of what to expect, of what developers should expect, what residents can expect. Um, and so development that uh, deviates from that, whether by, um, you know, especially development that exploits rules to that were intended to uh, reinforce existing zoning and preserve light and air and all of the reasons why zoning was implemented that Anthony uh, referenced in his presentation, I feel like that is overdevelopment. Um, and, you know, on a broader scale, I think we can think about um, the limits in our city in terms of um, access to school seats and enough water and electricity in the grid and all of those types of things. I think those sort of more systemic and infrastructural um, 
resources that will are strained by uh, by overdevelopment. Thank you. Does Civitas want to jump in? And if folks who are panelists raise your hands, I will uh, know that you want to answer any of these questions. But you can also feel free to unmute and jump in. Okay, not seeing it, I, I would say for my definition, when you see a building plan or a development, and you're like, wow, everything else on the block is six stories or 20 stories, but that building that's 20 stories or 30 stories is 600 feet tall what's going on here. Uh, anything that violates the predictability uh, is where we, uh, where I go to friends and Civitas and the community board and Gail Brewer and others and ask, how are they doing this? This doesn't seem like they should be allowed to. And more often than not, we find that they've been creating loopholes or bending the rules or sometimes just plain breaking the law. Civitas wanna jump in? Yeah, I think that you and Rachel both put it pretty well, uh, but are you hearing me? I thought I unmuted. We can hear you. Yeah, OK. Uh, and I think if you remember on 96th Street, uh, about 10 years ago, we uh, we took 12 stories off of a building that was overbuilt, you know, uh, with totally private money uh, after it was there. Uh, so it's uh, I think you're very consistent. They they overextended the uh, park park improvement district in that particular case. Um, but I think one of the things that come up when whether you believe in where Civitas is on the in our height limits or where Anthony and the community board is, the thing is we just need a, a more rigorous uh, or more understandable set of rules so that you can predict it. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Next question is uh, on the blood center. Um, I took a moment during this forum to go through the uh, submissions on our website. Uh, we have 665 uh, submissions, uh, uh, actually now 666. Uh, while I was talking, uh, I did a quick poll and so far there's 636 uh, signatures in opposition. Um, and then there's about, um, I think, uh, 10 to 20 in support, uh, and, uh, for, and and so uh, that's just something folks should know about and continue to please weigh in. Uh, so the question which we received, so I'm just going to read the question. This is not my voice. This is somebody else's. Um, I would do an impersonation if I knew who it was. Uh, I live across the street from the Julie Richmond High School, a 100-year complex of buildings and basketball courts on East 68th Street and 2nd Avenue. If we assume, as I do, that the developers covered the property as much as they do that of the blood center on East 67th Street between 1st and 2nd, my question is this, would the Board of Education be treated as any other commercial actor in the event they receive an attractive proposal from a developer? Uh, I, I'll turn it over to uh, friends and CBA before I, I, share, I share my lived experience. I don't know. Um, I would hope not. Um, uh, a, a number of years ago, uh, the the blood center asked um, to do a swap of their their lot um, for the uh, JREC site, uh, and um, were unsuccessful, fortunately. Um, and so I'm I suspect that the I suspect that the Board of Education would not um, look uh, look well upon it I mean if, if if nothing else if you think about it from a sort of logistical standpoint it, you'd have to move all of those students somewhere else while you were building a new building even if it included Anthony, I, I wish the Board of Education was where where you are at <laughs> Let, let's Sorry. turn it over to friends and then I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and sorry to cut you off. Yeah, I don't have a lot more to add. I mean, I've seen proposals for in other locations around the city for private developers coming in and proposing to knock down a school building, build a tower, a, you know, market rate or luxury residential tower and stick a school in the basement. And, um, you know, I think that's 
looks like a great deal for a developer with a site like the Julia Richmond complex. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I, I don't share Anthony's optimism, I guess, about um, the Board of Ed's uh, commitment to its uh, facilities. So uh, I'll share my own lived experience. I got appointed to Community Board 8 in 2005. Uh, and wanted there to be a youth and education committee and no sooner did we found it than uh, the blood center came in as the issue we dealt with and they wanted it to do a uh, tower on the JREC site and they wanted to do a land swap and Anthony the solution that they had proposed was just to move the Julie Richmond schools out of the neighborhood because one mm -hmm. of the open sure. secrets is that the schools don't serve students in the neighborhood and for my part, I felt that it doesn't matter where the kids come from. If they go to school here, there are kids and we need to take care of them. Uh, and so the community board and uh, I believe uh, council member Jessica Lappin defeated the project, I believe not once, but twice uh, in my first term, I believe. Uh, yeah, it was my first term. Uh, we were advised by the principal that Deputy Mayor Alicia Glenn had told the schools that they were being moved out of the building, that they were gonna be swapped with the blood center. And Gail Brewer and State Senator Liz Kruger and I met with the principals. We communicated to Deputy Mayor Glenn that this was not acceptable. It was not something that would happen without going through community review and did not have our support. And uh, that stopped there. This most recent proposal was uh, something that uh, there is no elected official that I know supports it and it is currently going through the process. We have a question from Trev Jones. Uh, if you can please share the time and locations for the blood center meetings. Uh, sure, they're on. They're taking place on Zoom. Um, the best way to find the community board meetings is to, to go to the community board website, which is cb8m, as in manhattan.com. Uh, you can register for the meetings there. Um, the community board is also taking written comments um, which you can submit in advance. Uh, so I welcome you to do that. Um, you know, I think reiterating concerns around the blood center early and often is going to be the key. Um, not only, you know, I think as the council member has said, he needs to hear everybody's, uh, you know, opinions on this as do uh, all of our elected officials at every level um, to defeat this. You know, uh, the only person, the only elected that I know supporting this is the mayor. And uh, so that's a, a big one to fight. Uh, just, uh, we have a number of comments from Writing Lives 878-858-48481, uh, sharing that there's a rally opposing the Blood Center Commercial Tower on Sunday, May 23rd, 2021 at 2 p.m. at 317 East 67th Street uh, at the Julia Richmond Education uh, Complex. Um, a question from the same person about what is being done to stop, but I think you're hearing from uh, friends, you're hearing from CP8 about the uh, meetings, you also shared the rally, and those are all the right things uh, that folks should be doing. Um, and I'm just trying to see if there's any other blood center questions so I can wrap things up. I think there was a, a question just about um, uh, what do you call it, uh, the impact of uh, allowing the blood center to change the mid block and if it would have repercussion elsewhere. Uh, Marty Bell has shared the dates and times uh, and the links where you can RSVP and register over Zoom. So it's May 12th and May 25th, both dates at 630. And uh, you will have to continue to keep showing up. That is how you win. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to close out on Blood Center uh, and move on to the rest of the questions. Uh, and I want to thank folks for being willing to stay on. Uh, we have a question on the overall topic of preservation. Uh, the first question, and again, I'm just reading a question from somebody else. Many people are talking about using opening space in the city to build more buildings. Is there a legislative way to stop building? After this pandemic, it seems that we have a lot of vacant space that could be used for affordable housing, workspaces, and spaces for community use productively. 
And then are there any neighborhoods where buildings can be preserved and rehabbed instead of torn, torn down? Anyone wants to jump in? I think that's probably like six questions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I think our uh, Civitas's point would be uh, what we're doing at 97th Street, really, where, uh, and, and that is that, that open space is so precious in Board 8 right now. And, uh, and it really, uh, we need to protect it as much as possible by in, in any way possible. And I think that's a big issue at St. Catharines and Julia Richards, Richmond as well. Uh, as far as neighborhoods where buildings can be preserved and rehab, yes, any neighborhood, yeah. anywhere, in, please, you know, like yeah. the more preservation and reuse, the better. There's a saying in uh, the preservation world that the greenest building is the one that's already built. Um, and so, you know, reuse is, is always a good thing. Um, more to the point, you know, there are historic districts uh, around the city uh, and in those areas uh, it's mandated. Uh, the uh, HPD, and, and uh, we've got the person who does the Housing Connect, but I, I did work with HPD for uh, my first two years of this second term on uh, basically there are rehabilitation loans available for people who are interested in maintaining existing rent regulated buildings or extending rent regulation in existing buildings or turning buildings into affordable housing, whether it's minor repairs, new boilers, or even gut rehabs. Um, there are about 21 questions that keep coming in, about three times more than we had when we started the questions. I'm gonna encourage panelists. I, I know we've seen uh, folks answering questions. Feel free to use the Q&A function to answer questions. And we'll keep uh, trying to churn through as much as we can, no matter what we will be done at uh, 7.45, so we'll try to pick things up. Um, uh, a question is how capable and willing is New York State and New York City to actually accomplish affordable housing? Uh, and I think that there's HPD has funding, HDC has funding, uh, DHCR has funding and the mayor has made a commitment to do 300,000 units of affordable housing. There's questions about uh, what the right context is and what the definition of affordable is and whether it should be for lower income people or middle income people, but it is there. Is it true that a person must have a social worker or be homeless in order to get affordable housing in New York City? Uh, NYCHA projects don't get completed. What will be different this time to actually get projects financed, supervised and finished on time and on budget? So I'll throw that to Aileen at HPD. Do you need to be homeless or have a social worker to get affordable housing? Yeah, so HPD uh, develops and preserves Department of Housing Preservation and Development uh, of housing at a variety of income levels. So we serve uh, folks who have no income all the way up to folks earning middle income. Uh, the majority of our housing is for low income and uh, below, but um, that is to say that no, there is not a, a requirement to be homeless or have a social worker to access affordable housing. As I uh, mentioned in my presentation earlier, all of HPD and HDC's uh, units are offered through a lottery system, which is hosted on New York City Housing Connect, so anyone can apply and be considered for those developments. Uh, I will highlight that we do have a uh, set aside uh, amount of units for folks experiencing homelessness. Uh, it's a direct referral from uh, folks residing in shelter to access uh, permanent affordable housing. So that is a tool that we use to try and do uh, what Caitlin highlighted, which is provide uh, folks in shelter with permanent housing, um, but that is just a portion of the housing that we develop and preserve. So, uh, you know, anyone who can meet the requirements of a development and those vary based on the funding and financing sources or, uh, you know, tax abatement being used uh, can, can access that housing through Housing Connect. 
Uh, one of the uh, person asked a question uh, ahead of this uh, presentation, which I think we answered, but uh, what do you do to plan to do and what can you do to see that landlords do not run amok with recent increases once de Blasio is gone? How will you save rent stabilized and prevent landlords from getting back to being able to deregulate apartments and change what they deem to be market value? That is completely what local law uh, 64 that I authored does. It forces them to register with the city. They used to register with the state. Now they have to register with the city. If they don't register with the state, there's no fine. With the city, there will be a fine. Additionally, they're going to have to offer the apartments through this platform. And it's going to be very hard for them to go back to a lot of the corrupt practices that they were involved in when everyone can see it on a centralized platform. Uh, somebody asked before the, plat the uh, event, how can unoccupied housing be converted to be made available as affordable housing for people who cannot afford to buy? Why is New York City allowing too tall overpriced buildings to be built for resident purposes when no one lives in them and we need affordable housing? Uh, I think you heard our conversation around using affordable, uh, taking the existing vacant housing and using it to house homeless immediately. Uh, whatever's left over could also, there's going to be so much left over. We could also incentivize landlords and offer tax rebates and lower their taxes for taking existing uh, market rate and making it affordable for people. And I believe everything everyone's talking about is about how we can stop and uh, so, so how we can realign our zoning with building housing for real New Yorkers, not just buildings for billionaires. Just moving down, um, we got a question uh, on Facebook about uh, the blood center vote. So I want to be clear, this is going to be going through Community Board 8. Uh, there are going to be the two meetings. Uh, there's going to be a meeting on May 12th that is important for you to show up. It will then go to May 25th for another special meeting. Um, at some point in June, it will be referred out to the uh, borough president. Mm -hmm. At that point, the borough president will have uh, a chance to weigh in on it, at which point it will go to the city council. In the city council, I am one of 51 votes. In the city council, there is a practice known as member deference. Uh, it is usually used to upzone communities, as it rarely used to protect communities. Uh, in the past, I have had members vote against me when we rezoned to stop super talls in the East River 50s. And I was criticized as having broken the zoning process and broken member deference by actually having a city, a, a community grassroots led planning process that wasn't profit driven, but was driven to build more affordable housing. Uh, I don't know if member deference will still be here in September. And so I need the community to keep coming out, making sure their voice is heard and making sure that whatever vote I, I may take in September or later this year, that we actually have the support to make sure that the 50 other colleagues in the council will vote with me. Um, also, uh, Marty Bell has mentioned that tomorrow morning we'll be up in about 12 hours. Uh, we'll be having our first Friday meeting where all of you are always welcome to come. Uh, continuing through here, um, Somebody was asking about uh, the SOHO NOHO. Um, and so the question is, are you in favor of the mayor's plan to rezone NOHO SOHO, which will in turn the neighborhood wider, increase the height and forever change the look of this historic district and displace many present low or moderate income residents? Yes or no, isn't there a better and more carbon neutral way to renovate existing building stock into affordable housing? There is absolutely a better way to do it as we heard uh, the greenest building is the building that is already there, and it is a lot less expensive to renovate existing housing stock and convert it into high quality affordable housing. Uh, there was a report by uh, GVHSP uh, that raised serious questions about the fact that the plan called for the displacement of about 600 units of existing rent regulated housing in order to build ostensibly uh, I believe something like uh, a, a modicum of more affordable housing. And uh, the concern was that uh, we'd actually be losing affordable housing versus gaining it. Recently, uh, several uh, met council on housing as well as a group of tenants called Tenants Pack came out uh, sharing that question. And so 
that is a huge concern for me. And at this point, until that question is answered about how they will preserve existing affordable housing and actually add affordable housing stock, not just blowing it all away in favor of new luxury developments that won't replace what was lost. Um, I, I am not supporting it until I get that question answered. Uh, we are through with the pre-submitted questions. We're now gonna try to get through as many of the 20 questions. If you pre-submitted a question that did not get answered or have a question in the chat that does not get answered, please feel free to email me at bkalos at benkalos.com and we'll do our best to get it answered. Um, we had a number of questions for Aileen about um, the Housing Connect system. Uh, one anonymous attendee had questions about uh, an error message they received. They don't think that, they, they believe that they should be qualified and that they're getting the error uh, message. Uh, the affordable housing opportunity we're talking about is um, on York Avenue, 1402. It's very nice. They're gonna be studio apartments. So I guess, are there limits on the number of people in the house who can live in them or what, what types of things? And just so you know, uh, for that attendee, the purpose of the law that I wrote, Local Law 64, is we kept reading stories about how there'd be 10 apart affordable apartments and 150,000 people would apply. Uh, the, the New York Times, when they covered this, said 25 million people had applied for affordable housing, which is, uh, sorry, uh, not people, there were 25 million applications, which is basically uh, four times the people who live in New York City. And so one of the problems is that even if you get a lottery number, at least previously, of like 100,000, you might end up first on the list because people were applying for affordable housing that didn't even qualify. Housing Connect 2.0 is, is supposed to filter you at the front end so you don't waste the time applying for something you don't qualify for. So I'll turn it over to Aileen to just answer any additional questions on that. Yeah, so I, I, I did send that person a private message as well with uh, our contacts. But um, yeah, so Housing Connect, when you are browsing the ads and looking to apply, it does evaluate your profile against the requirements of the development. So for example, 1402 York, they're all studio units. So it's only made available to households of one or two people. So if your profile in Housing Connect does not match the requirements of that development, such as if you have three people on your profile, it will give you a warning message letting you know it doesn't appear that your profile matches the development, so you might not be contacted for this opportunity. That being said, you can override that message and say, I acknowledge this and still apply because you are able to update your profile in real time. So if there are any other changes to your profile, let's say in a few weeks, you know, you get a new job or there's a change in your household, you can go into Housing Connect, update your profile, and that will be reflected across all your applications that have not yet been processed. So, you know, if it seems to be an error message, I let that person know that they should reach out to us because we can help them try and understand uh, where that error is coming from. But it is a functional message there so that folks have a better idea when they're looking at ads if it actually matches the household questionnaire they filled out with the information on their their household and the income, your, your household income. Uh, Lucille had a question about affordable housing for seniors. Uh, are, is there, are there any affordable housing for senior opportunities on Housing Connect right now and do they come up? Yes, there, there are. Uh, so HPD has a program specifically dedicated to senior housing. It's called the SARA program. And so we offer uh, some of our developments are specifically for households with a member who is 62 years or older. So there actually is a development right now in Housing Connect uh, that is accepting applications called, um, let me just look it up so I don't say it wrong. I'm gonna say it wrong anyway, Deva Voice Senior Housing, uh, that's in uh, Brooklyn. And we have new lotteries being posted every day. So the more that are coming in the pipeline uh, will be posted here as they become available. And you'll see on that advertisement, it will both note that it's senior housing and you'll see that there is a 100% um, preference for folks 62 years or older. And just to clarify, um, that you just need one household member to be 62 or older. So you don't need everyone to be 
62 or older, but often those developments have studio and one bedroom units because we tend to see senior households on the smaller side. And the majority of these developments also come with project-based section eight. So households only pay 30% uh, of their income to rent. Uh, they just have to qualify for section eight. So those are some uh, really great opportunities for seniors that we have available regularly on Housing Connect. Uh, Aileen, we, we have fans. Are, are you free to speak to a group of uh, folks in Midtown South about uh, Housing Connect? Oh yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, I will reach out to, oh, I see John. I'll reach out to him. Perfect. Uh, I'm going to move that into the answered and just you'll fetch it there and we're, we're happy to stop by and talk about it. Um, sorry, there's just so many questions just flooding in. Um, uh, we have a question from Lana. We will work with you to deal with it. So just email bkalos at benkalos and we will do that. Um, I'm just looking for folks who have specific um, we, we have an, a question about uh, the federal government paying for uh, a housing first system and basically writing live asks who will pay rent for feds only pay for temporary. Uh, well, the federal government pays for um, rental assistance called the Section 8 program. So we know that they pay for long term permanent housing. Uh, the city also has its own rental assistance program, City FAHEPS, um, and the state has its own program, FAHEPS. So using these different uh, sources are ways that you can pay for individuals' rents. Um, we also know that we can underwrite rents for a building, and that's done using capital subsidies and sometimes Section 8 vouchers. So we know that there are different, di sorry, different revenue mixes that can actually be providing rental assistance to New Yorkers. It's not just the federal government. And in New York City, uh, we are one of the few municipalities that hasn't adopted a housing first uh, approach. It is mandated by HUD, but um, HUD hasn't really been enforcing that mandate over the last administration. So we um, think that the new administration is gonna be a little bit more forceful with ensuring that municipalities adopt this perspective. Thank you. Uh, Olive Freud asked, do you think there should be a limit on density as an area such as ours and what factors do you consider? So we, we do have a limit on density. It is uh, 10 on the avenues in uh, the Upper East Side. Uh, and it is, I believe, 3.4 in the RAB, but the uh, community facilities get a 4.5. They get a bonus of about one FAR. A lot of the work that we're talking about right now, uh, what you're hearing from friends is about saying that land folks shouldn't be allowed to override the zoning. Um, and what we're also hearing is uh, from uh, Civitas CV8 is that um, we're trying to make sure that if a building can be built at 210 feet and house the same number of human beings in it, uh, that we want to make sure that those buildings are predictable. And uh, actually, I'll turn it over to Anthony and Civitas who can explain more. But um, whether the building is uh, the, the density, the FAR, the floor area ratio, governs how much space you can have to build and what the floor plate looks like. And whether those floors are, are in a narrow, tall building that's 700 feet tall uh, or uh, if it is in a short squat building that's 210 feet tall, uh, the FAR is related to how many humans you can put there. And so I, uh, I'll turn it over to them who can explain this better than I can, because I, I, I right. wish our, our zoning was, was three-dimensional since the buildings it governs are three-dimensional. <laughs> Actually, you, ex you explained it very well. I, I think that the, in theory, density is limited. And um, it, it's a kind of irony of the, um, of the zoning resolutions over the years that they were set up with some ultimate goal in mind. Uh, the 1916 zoning imagined that by the year 2000, there would be 30 million people living in New York City. 
and the 1961 zoning imagined there would be 16 million people living in New York City by the year 2000. Um, uh, fortunately for all of us, neither of those uh, predictions came true, but there, there is built into the zoning resolution a kind of maximum density. Um, and uh, I think a lot of the frustration that people feel now is that we've already achieved what our neighbors feel is maximum density. And it's just that there's a, a poor distribution of, um, uh, of uh, luxury apartments versus affordable apartments that has uh, sort of created a housing crisis that may not ex that exists. Um, but isn't a matter of density so much as distribution. Oh, that's more my opinion than anybody else's. But <laughs> Well, I think Anthony's right about the distribution issue for sure. But I think one of the confusions uh, is language and that, you know, sometimes density is also, it used to be regarded or done on the basis of zoning room count. And, uh, and you, and, and you control the number of rooms in a building, as well as the height and the, and the uh, lot coverage. And that uh, has now been displaced with um, 680 square feet uh, per occupant, or per, I'm sorry, per apartment in practically every zoning district on the east side. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're, you're, if anything, most of the new tall buildings are less dense than the buildings they take down because you'll find a lot more people are living in the 60 foot high tenements uh, quite a, more often than not, than, than are gonna be going in the tall luxury buildings. And that, that brings you back to your affordable issues and trying to, and preservation issues as well. And, and so that's actually what DCP found that we were actually losing mm -hmm. the, the units. Um, mm -hmm. We have, uh, I'm gonna wrap up here. Uh, We've got a lot of questions. If you didn't get answered, please feel free to email. Uh, we also have more events. We do First Friday and I'm not going anywhere. These folks aren't going anywhere. There's gonna be CB8 hearings galore. Um, we, we've had a lot of folks who, who, are, uh, who are asking questions about um, trying to build more housing. And I think, and uh, just a, a very supply demand questions and about building taller, building more, uh, remove all zoning regulations type comments. <laughs> and um, the issue is that, and I referenced it earlier, during the pandemic, we lost people in New York City. No question about it, whether we like it or not, people left. And as of the, before the pandemic, the New York Times did a story saying that we had 5,000 vacant condos that weren't on the market. And we have a, I believe a five or 10 year supply of condos. And we're not seeing those condos become affordable despite having an abundance of supply. Uh, right now on Street Easy, there are 22,607 apartments for rent. Um, and there are 17,520 apartments for sale. And uh, with the combined 40,000 vacant units, and that's just what's available on the market right now the affordable housing crisis isn't over. And so part of what we're seeing is a market where uh, land, many, many of the landlords are so insulated from the market, they've earned so much income that they, they don't have to rent. They're not subject to the same market forces as you or I might be as an average person if we had one unit or, or a small building where folks might have more incentives. So um, last question I'll throw is from Magda Katz. How are the planning commissioners chosen? It seems like they've given developers what they want to build. How was the 57th Street allowed to become the center of mega buildings? Uh, so the, the quick answer is elections matter. Uh, the mayor appoints the majority of the city planning commission. Whoever the next mayor is will get to decide the future of our city. The borough presidents get each an appointment. Uh, the public advocate gets an appointment. Uh, they are subject to an advice and consent from the city council. The city council has typically been a rubber stamp. I'm one of the few council members who actually voted against uh, appointments or uh, in the council uh, and has used our advice and consent power. 
uh, but generally the council tends to respect the choice of whoever is appointing them. Similarly, the member deference uh, at 57th Street, Billionaires Row, elected officials, the city just said it's as of right, they can do whatever they wanted as they created the loopholes. Well, what I was able to do as a council member when they came to Sutton and started deciding that they were gonna start putting up these towers uh, in my district because of member deference, I was able to work with friends to understand the issue at 180 East 88th Street. And then when we saw it pop up at 57 Sutton, 58 Sutton, we're able to organize a community very much like this meeting. If you go back, you can watch the archives. We used to have a group called East River 50s Alliance here. And we were able to mobilize the community very much like you're seeing around the blood center. People uh, voted with their bodies by showing up at meetings. They, they voted with their checkbooks and they gave whatever they could. Uh, we built a coalition in the East River 50s of over 400 individuals. Uh, I think 20 or 30, maybe 50 buildings. People all over New York City showed up and we did something no one had ever done before, which is we rezoned a community neighborhood led by the residents and it was grassroots. It was with support of Gail Brewer, Congress member Carol Maloney and Liz Kruger. And we were able to rezone to stop Billionaires Road from continuing. The building in question at 58 Sutton was striving to be 1400 feet tall. It's now 800 feet tall. It is being built. We are in litigation. I'm representing the community on it. And we took the momentum from that and were able to work with friends to block the voids loophole and fill that in the Upper East and Upper West Side. And they had a map uh, earlier. And if you go back and see it, and it's actually up on our website, I believe, at pencalis.com slash uh, commercial voids. Um, there's still the central business district in Billionaires Row where you can still build those empty voids as well as in the finance district. And so um, that's going to be something that's going to be on the ballot in June too, of whether or not uh, you want elected want to elect officials who are willing to do something about that. Um, so there's a lot. Of elections have consequences. Um, everything that everyone you heard from today doing is uh, the hard work, the day in day out, fighting and doing what we can to uh, get affordable housing, uh, preserve the affordable housing that we have and make sure that people are following the rules. So uh, we're, we're a little bit over and I wanna thank all of our participants. Um, I wanna also just thank uh, my team uh, who have been uh, doing all the things from our uh, operator uh, and the rest of my team who've been here. Uh, so just a big thank you uh, to our panels. And again, if you liked what they had to say, please feel free to support them. Uh, we had HPD. I want to thank them for joining us. Friends of the Upper East Side Historic District. Uh, they are a nonprofit. If you are concerned about the blood center, you can provide funding to them. Uh, Community Board 8, uh, who will be having the hearings. They are a government entity. Uh, we have Civitas. If you are interested in the 350 feet uh, program to get affordable housing and then prescription home and their advocacy for a housing first model. Thank you all. Uh, again, if you have more questions that weren't answered, free, feel, feel free to email vkalos at benkalos.com or any of the participants from tonight. Thank you. And uh, I'll see a number of you tomorrow morning at First Friday. Bye.